this is a little nuts because uh, I am on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, and I am on YouTube live. So uh, if you saw me just a couple of minutes ago trying to putz around and get all these cameras going, if you could see um, what I have here, I've got camera number one with Instagram, I've got camera number two with Facebook Live, I've got camera number three with YouTube Live, and I've got camera number four over there just in case something goes wrong with the other three. So if I, it seems like I'm looking somewhere else, it's because I have a different audience in front of me. But this is um, uh, exciting opportunity for me to share some pretty extraordinary mind secrets for how to use the power of your mind to create your life by design. I wanted to share these strategies, strategies with you because I've spent the last 30 years trying to figure out how to feel peaceful inside, how to feel like everything's going to be okay, how to love and accept myself more, how to um, use the power of my mind to manifest prosperity or abundance or more peace in my relationships. You know, people are always focusing on their health, wealth, and their relationships. And so I wanted to figure out how do you actually find that peace, right? So I call it inner pieces, right? I don't know anybody that personally that has inner peace 24 hours a day. I've experienced it many times where I'm just happy and joyful and I feel very secure, but there's other times where I felt very scared or anxious or angry or frustrated or overwhelmed or shut down or unmotivated. And so I've tried to figure out over the years how to feel more peaceful how to feel more at ease, how to feel more calm, how to feel more secure, regardless of what's going on around me. I wanted to know how to feel safe and peaceful on the inside, regardless of what's happening externally. Most of the time we try to feel peaceful by controlling what's going on outside of us. If I can just get my environment this way, if I can just make enough money, if I can just marry the right person, if this person just acts this way, then everything will be okay. If this doesn't happen and this doesn't happen, then I'll feel safe and I'll feel okay. Well, we can't control those things. Even if we try, even if we try to micromanage them, uh, it still doesn't work very well. And so you go back to the serenity prayer, right? Accept the things you cannot change, right? So be cool with not trying to change things um, that are out of your control. Like I can't control the weather. So if it's sunny, cool. If it's raining, cool. If it's cold outside, I wear, I wear a bigger jacket, <laughs> right? I wear a coat. And so control the things you can control. Right? So with the serenity prayer, it's, um, you know, God give me the strength to control the things I can control, to let go of the things that I can't, and to have the wisdom to know the difference between the two. And so we want to make sure that we're focusing on the things that we can control. Well, it turns out most people do not realize how much control they have over what's going on in their life. And so I learned um, that personally. You know, thinking that I couldn't control a lot of the feelings that I had, a lot of the thoughts that I had, when it turns out I definitely could control them, I just didn't know how. And see, that's the thing. If you don't know how to do something, then it feels powerless. But once you understand, then you have a lot of influence over yourself. You have a lot more control and inner strength. And that's what we need to learn. As, as kids, we don't, usually don't know this stuff. But as we get older, the, the trick, the key, is to develop that maturity, which is being able to feel frustrated and, and be okay with it, be able to handle things um, in a way that causes more peace or allows you to make a better choice in the situation because you're choosing how to respond, you're being intentional, instead of emotionally reacting, which is most of the time what people do. We're not, react, we're not dealing with the situation for what it is, we're usually dealing with um, what we believe about the situation and how we've reacted to it in the past. So we usually go through life on autopilot, reacting to situations or people based on our programming from the past, based on the beliefs that we got when we were children, these childish beliefs, right? Based on the beliefs that we adopted from our parents and maybe our parents uh, struggled. I mean, they're human too, right? So I know they had their struggles. But a lot of times we just adopt the same characteristics, values, and beliefs as our parents, right? I grew up in uh, near Chicago, and so I rooted for the Chicago Bears, right? The Chicago Bulls. Why was I a fan? Because that's what everybody around me, they were a fan. Um, the only difference uh, was Cubs or Sox, right? And that often depended on if you were on the north side or the south side, or what your dad or what your grandfather uh, watched, or maybe your mom was into it, or maybe your grandmother or grandfather were into it. And so we just usually adopt whatever values or norms we grow up with. But as adults, we got to take a look at that and say, hey, is this really what I want? Is this really um, what's serving me? Or is it time for an upgrade? It's like a mental garage sale. we got to go through our stuff and figure, 
figure out, do we want to really keep this? Is it still bringing value or do we want to, um, uh, you know, donate this to somebody or maybe we need to just throw it in the trash, right? And there's definitely beliefs that we tend to have that we need to trash. And so um, that put me on this pursuit, this lifelong pursuit of trying to figure out how our mind works and how to use it to our advantage. And it's pretty exciting because uh, 30 years later, right, I started this pursuit back, to, back in uh, 1998. I started my first year of college going to Indiana University for uh, clinical psychology. And then, uh, and then after I got my bachelor's and my master's and I was working towards my doctorate, uh, and I was studying, I had been studying peak performance strategies like hypnotism and neurolinguistic programming and anything that seemed to help people to get rapid results. I had been studying that as, at the same time that I was going to school for psychology. And in 1995, when I got my master's degree, I opened up my first practice. And that's when I really started to get good at learning things about human behavior because when you're in the field, when you're in the trenches practicing, it's way different than just research right? When you're seeing people day after day after day, every kind of personality, and I've been blessed enough to work with people from every culture and every, um, every country. I've had people from all around the world come into my office for different things from every religion. I've had monks and Muslims and Christians and Catholics and, and uh, you know, all, um, if, if I, uh, um, Judaism, I mean, all the, all the major uh, religions, right? So, um, you know, and it's been great because I've really learned from talking with other humans that regardless of what you believe or subscribe to, I've worked with atheists as well, um, and agnostics, that I'm trying to include everybody, <laughs> that on the inside, we're all the same. We all want to feel more love, more safe, more peace. We all want to have more of um, what we want in our life. We want to feel important. We want to feel a connection. We want to feel like we matter. And then uh, we also want to feel... Uh, like everything's going to be okay in the future, right? So we're always trying to, at some level, create more pleasure and comfort and avoid pain. And, uh, and so we go through our lives developing these strategies, these unconscious strategies for how to do that. So, um, so then I had the experience of doing tens of thousands of individual, individual sessions as long as... I'm sorry, i got to slow down. I'm going too fast. <laughs> um, so I did lots of individual sessions as well as doing a lot of groups. And, um, and the groups were really exciting because then I got to see how people interacted with one another for years. I watched how groups of 5, 10, 30, 100, a couple hundred, um, I've had groups where thousands of people are in the audience. And I get to see how people react and respond when other people are watching. Okay, So I've learned a tremendous amount about what drives us at that unconscious level, that emotional level, that deepest part of us. And, uh, and so it's given me some really exciting insights and discoveries and breakthroughs in addition to all the hundreds and hundreds of people that I have studied, researched, or trained with that have also been doing this. Uh, people from thousands of years ago and then people from today who are also doing the same thing so that we have this, we call it the um, uh, melting pot, right? Or um, a knowledge pool, right? And so you put all this knowledge from every, that everybody has into this pool and before, you know, you had to go to the library and get it or go to classes and seminars. But now people are doing it through podcasts. You can literally push a phone or ask, uh, ask Siri or Alexa. And, and uh, all of a sudden you're getting this wisdom from people who have spent their whole life studying something. And now they're giving you the cliff notes. And that's extraordinary. And so I wanted as much of that as possible. So, you know, since I was a kid, I've been listening to audiobooks. I started out with cassette tapes and a Walkman, right? So I put my cassette tape in there, put my headphones on and walk around the block. And, and I just, I put miles and miles and miles, thousands of miles. I probably wore a groove on the, you know, on my block, uh, just to how many laps I've walked around listening to empowering, amazing people. And so now from all of that, I'm here to share some of the cliff notes for what I've learned. Some of the things that, um, that I've picked up over the years that I've shared with so many people to try to figure out what works the best. And today we're talking about mesmerizing secrets for weight loss, right? How to create that health and that vitality and that energy body that makes you feel strong and healthy and confident, that gives you vitality. Now, one of the big ways to improve your health is to not focus on your physical health, but to focus on your emotional health. And it's really the time, we're in a really amazing time in human history right now. Because one, we have access to the internet and smartphones so we can connect with each other in extraordinary ways. 
For me to think that I can connect with a couple hundred or a couple thousand people right now on different channels and different formats and different audiences just by hooking up all these cameras, pushing some buttons and talking, I mean, that, that's amazing. That blows my mind, right? And then I was watching an insurance commercial yesterday, and Ted Danza was the person they, had, uh, they paid to do this commercial. And he was talking about the importance of getting emotional health checkups as well as physical health checkups. I've never heard anybody on TV actually say that before, especially from an insurance company, right? So I thought that was amazing. And then with the Me Too movement and everything else, um, with the talks on sexual abuse and what people are, are finally feeling safe enough to have the conversations about the you know, unfair and rude and dis disrespectful things that have been happening probably since the beginning of time. We're in a really exciting place where we can do something about it, right? Where we can start having those conversations instead of it being everybody's dirty little secret that ends up making us feel like we're worthless or we're not good or we're less than. You know, I will tell you, um, one of the things that I've learned to do over all these years is um, go after the beliefs that human beings have. Oh, agua. Secret number one for weight loss. If there is a, uh, um, a fountain of youth, you know what it is? It's full of water, <laughs> right? Water is the best weight loss jug on the planet. You know that, right? Yeah, of course you do. Because a lot of people don't drink enough water. So I'm about to go on a tangent about water, so I'm going to come back. But one of the things that I focus on is beliefs. I'm a belief hunter, right? I go after the beliefs. Wherever there's a block, if there's something you want and there's a block here, it's almost always because there's a belief. And this belief is limiting, right? It's a fear, false evidence appearing real. It's something that says you can't do this, you're not good enough, you're not capable, it won't work, who do you think you are, um, you know, whatever it is, right? You're not enough, you're less than. And, um, and so what we have to do is we have to figure out what that belief is and then crush it. Turn it into a stepping stone, right? Knock it over. So what was a block is now a stepping stone and now you can see higher, right? And if you keep knocking over those blocks, you can see higher and higher. You get a, a broader perspective on what's going on. And then all of a sudden you have the ability to go, oh, I didn't notice that before. Oh, I, hadn't, I didn't recognize that that was happening before. Oh, I never connected those dots before. I didn't realize that those dots were, you know, I didn't realize that that, was, that, that wasn't my stuff. You know, I remember a client one time, now I've heard this many times, um, but I remember this one client in particular because she had this breakthrough that, all these struggles that she had been dealing with were not actually her struggles. They weren't her issues. They were her mom's issues. And she never put it together. And when she had that realization, right in front of me, I watched her just have this aha moment. It was so beautiful. She's just sitting there in the chair going, oh my gosh, that's not my stuff. That's, that's not my stuff. That was my mother's issue. I thought that was my, that wasn't mine. That was my mother's. Oh my gosh. That's not my stuff, right? Now, it's not just about moms, because moms do the best they can, just like dads do the best they can. Sometimes that's not enough, right? Sometimes people could do better, but they're not getting the maturity, or they're not taking the classes, or they weren't exposed to it. Who knows? I'm not about excuses, but I do understand why people do things. I don't think people are purposely trying to be mean or hurtful um, to themselves or others. I think that a lot of times it's just comes across that way. But this woman realized that a lot of the problems that she thought were her problems were not her problems. She had borrowed them like an old library book from somebody else, and she needed to return it and give it back, right? And she walked, she must have said it like 50 times. It was like a mantra in her head. That's not my stuff. That's not my stuff. That's not my stuff. Oh my gosh. That's not, and you could see her get lighter and lighter and more free. I've heard, I heard this, um, another one of my clients one time, she said, that's not my clowns and that ain't my circus, right? And I thought that was really funny. They ain't my clowns, that ain't my circus, right? And so I thought that was great. It's just another way of saying, hey, a lot of times the problems you're trying to, pro you're trying to solve, maybe there's, those aren't the, the right problems, right? Maybe those aren't the right problems. Like when people are trying to lose weight, they focus on starvation, dieting, counting calories, exercise boot camps, buying supplements, um, depriving themselves, feeling like they can't have all their favorite stuff, you're trying to solve the wrong problem. That is not the problem. That's not the issue. And that's why there's a 99% failure rate, okay? The real issue is self-care. The real issue is self-acceptance. The real issue is taking time to love yourself and make yourself a priority. That's the real issue. And that's the stuff 
people don't usually like to talk about because it's the ooey gooey emotional sensitive touchy feely stuff that most people just stuff down or they talk quietly with their friends or their therapist but they never actually really have a, a conversation that starts to turn it around and that's what I want to have with you today right now I want to have this serious conversation about how much of a priority are you making yourself how much are you taking care of yourself how good are the boundaries that you have set for yourself or, or for set for other people that need those boundaries without you having guilt or shame. If you set a boundary for yourself with somebody and you feel guilty about it, that's a red flag right there. That means that you were trained to feel guilty when you were little. And anybody that is very mature and loving is not going to train you to feel guilty when you're little. And I don't care if it's, you know, religion or if it's a parent. Your parents are just human beings, right? So, I'm a parent, I'm just a human being. What I tell my kids, is that final say-so, total truth? No, it's just my version of the truth, okay? Are my, my kids gonna have some issues growing up? Probably, they're human. Am I trying to prevent them? Yes, okay, I'm trying to be real mindful, but heck, I might be also be creating problems I'm not even aware of, because we're human, we're not perfect. If you feel like you have to be perfect, if you've got an issue with perfectionism, that's another red flag, okay? That just means that you have this belief inside that you have to be perfect or what? Or you're not enough, or you're not good enough, or people won't love you, or people will abandon you, right? That's the lie, that's the lie. Now you might say, well, that's happened to me before. Uh, my parent uh, left me, I'm, I grew up in a, in a, in a um, orphanage, or my grandparents raised me. That had nothing to do with you. That is, that's not your issue, right? That's not your problem. That was those adults' issues. That was their problems. Well, my parents got divorced because of me. No, 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 no. Your parents got divorced because of their issues and probably because of the issues they had before they ever met each other. So, you know, one of the things that I say a lot is, um, you know, we don't attract our soulmates. We attract our woundmates. And then we play out our patterns and our dramas from our childhood. And if we're lucky enough to do the work and keep working together, you grow into soulmates. You grow into people who really love and accept each other for who they are without trying to change them because your whole focus is on growing yourself. When you get two people doing that, it's pretty spectacular what can happen. So, okay. So, when we start going after beliefs, here's the magic question to ask yourself. The magic question is this. What is achieving this goal? So today we're talking about weight loss. What is achieving weight loss going to ultimately do for you? If you drop, if you lose 40 pounds, 60 pounds, 70 pounds, 100 pounds, 150 pounds, what is that going to do for you? That's the question that you should write down and start, you know, writing out what you think the answers are, okay? And if you want to share any of these, then uh, please let me know. So, hi Kathleen, I'm glad you made it. And by the way, while we're going through here, Hey, how are you? Good to see everybody. So why we're here, um, Hillary, that's you, I see. I think that's Hillary. If that's you, Hillary, hi. <laughs> and so, um, all right, so um, if you have any questions while I'm going on my rant here, make sure you send them to me, okay? So um, you can just put them in the box here on Facebook and you can, um, I don't know, I think you can do that on uh, Instagram. Uh, YouTube, I'm not sure. So I can't see all of the camera for my YouTube, but, um, but answer your questions. And if I don't answer them here, then leave them in the comment boxes and then I will answer them that way for you, okay? Because really at the end of the day, I want to teach you a lot of great stuff. And then if you have any questions, that's what I'm here for, okay? So you get free resources today. So I'm not charging anybody by the hour or by the minute. So make sure you ask your questions now. It's a good deal. <laughs> all right. Did I say how awesome water is? I think I did. Okay, good. So do you have any water? You should get some water. So just turn your volume up, run, get some water, come back, or take me with you if you have your camera. So today we're going to talk about a couple things. Okay. Um, first, we're going to talk about that question that you ask yourself. And the real question is this. What do you think losing that weight is going to do for you in your life? Now, people will say, well, I think that um, if I lose that weight, I'll feel better about myself. Okay, so does that mean you don't feel good about yourself? Because maybe that's the real problem. Maybe the real problem is you don't feel good about yourself. And because you don't feel good about you, yourself, then you're not doing things to take care of yourself. Because um, if you did really care about yourself, 
you would do things that made you feel more loved. You would eat food that would give you more energy. You would go for a walk because it gives you a more peaceful mindset, right? You don't have to go do crazy exercise. You just go for a little stroll or get on a bicycle or shovel some snow or walk a dog or chase your cat. I mean, there's lots of things that you can do, play with your grandkids to get some fitness in that is fun. So if, you know, you get, keep asking that question. If, um, what do you think losing weight is going to do for you? What do you think it's going to get you? Well, I would be more social. So you're not being social? Well, maybe we should start by being more social. That's the problem to solve. Let's be more social. Go take some classes. Go hang out where other people are. Go to an, an art fair or listen to some music um, at a festival or uh, go to the movies, right? You can do lots of things. Go hang out at a bookstore and uh, hang out with other people. So... Um, just being social, you know, go to church more. There's lots of ways where you can be social where, you know, most of the time we think people are judging us, but they're not really judging us because they're too busy in their head judging themselves. More people are worried about what you're thinking of them than them sitting there worrying about you, <laughs> right? Most people are very self-sorted. We're very focused on ourselves. So, usually, I mean, people might go by and, and judge you, so, who cares? If somebody drives by and says, you're a banana, does that make you one? Right? If someone says, you're a banana, does that make you a banana? Are you a banana because somebody says you're a banana? No. That's silly, right? So, the same is true of anything else they say as well then, isn't it? Right? So, if somebody says something rude, then you just go up, oh, they're just throwing bananas. Because if they say something rude or they're judging you, they're revealing themselves. They're revealing where they're at. That's their clown. That's their circus. That's where they're at. That's not your stuff. That's their stuff, right? And so we've got to remind ourselves that the one that's probably judging you the most is you. You want to be worrying if other people are judging you if you weren't judging yourself. So I used to judge myself very harshly. I was definitely my own worst enemy. I would get so angry, furious at myself because I was so scared all the time, because I had so much anxiety about bad things happening all the time, because I did have a lot of bad things happening. So I had all these references in my head, all these memories. This is what happened. This is my reality. This is why I feel this way. I'm not making this up, okay? And in fact, me keeping myself in misery was like some kind of self-righteousness. It was like some kind of self-validation that, that if I would let that go, it was somehow making it less true or less important, which again is just an, a crazy belief. Keeping yourself suffering so that you can somehow validate that it actually happening happened, who do you have to validate it to? If it happened and you know it, that's all that needs to be said. You don't have to have a reason. You don't have to explain it to anybody, right? Who said you had to explain it to anybody? And if you grew up with people where you had to explain everything, that was your parents' stuff, that wasn't your stuff, okay? So, again, it's, you, and a lot of times we can't possibly understand this by ourselves because we have no outside perspective. As Scott, once, uh, one of my coaches used to say all the time, you can't see the label when you're in the bottle. It's very hard to be objective with yourself. And so that's why joining me as we go and we challenge some of these thoughts, perspectives, and ideas, you start to look at them in a different way and you're like, whoa, wait a second. I never thought of it that way before. If I always see things just from this side, then, you know, I might not ever notice that if I turn around, I see something completely different, okay? There might be something completely different on this side. I never noticed it from this side before. Or if I look at it from this side, I never noticed it from this side before, right? You ever hear that story about the five blind people that are all trying to figure out what an elephant is? And so they all got a piece of the elephant. So one of the blind people is holding the elephant's leg, he says, oh, uh, an elephant is like a tree trunk. And another person has one of the elephants, um, uh, has its tail. And he says, no, no, it's like a snake with, with grass on the end, right? Another one has the elephant's trunk. He says, no, it's like a, uh, like a garden hose. And then another person's pushing against the big side of the elephant going, no, an elephant is more like a big wall, right? They all had a piece of the truth, but they didn't have the whole truth. And the more you have the whole truth, the more you can have a more enlightened awareness of how things could be. And even then, it's still just an interpretation. Even then, it's still just an interpretation of the truth. And, you know, at the end of the day, 
Who knows exactly what the truth is? Maybe God, right? But we all get a glimpse of it based on our interpretation of the truth. Um, in the Talmud, a wise Jewish uh, religious book, it says, you don't see the world as it is, you see the world as you are. And so let's talk about this a little bit. So I'm going to give you a real grassroots, simple um, illustration here. This is, woo, this is a person, <laughs> okay? An artist, I am not, <laughs> but that's okay, all right? So now here's what happens. Let's start by saying we have two parts of our mind. Now this is going to be very generic, okay? But we're going to say you have your conscious mind and you have your unconscious mind, okay? So if you're just joining me before I'm doing my drawing and you don't know what this is or it's backwards, it might be backwards on one of these cameras, I apologize, but this is a C for your conscious mind. This is UM for your unconscious mind. Now, your conscious mind is the part of you that's in control of, it's, it's your analytical mind. It's the part of you that's taking information in through your five senses, through your eyes, through your ears, right now. Okay, so information comes in here through your unconscious mind. It comes in through here as well, but we'll talk about that in a little bit, okay? But your conscious mind is your analytical mind, so it's your decision maker. It decides what's right or wrong, good or bad, am I safe or not, right? So it's constantly trying to figure things out, analyze things, make sure that you're okay. And, um, and so usually it's the part of you where you're talking to yourself. When you're talking to yourself and having a conversation in your head, then this is the part of your mind you're using. Like even right now, you are having two conversations. You're having a conversation with me, and you're having a conversation with yourself in your head, right? You have a conversation with me, and you're having a conversation with yourself in your head. And so um, that's you analyzing whether you agree with what I say, if you've heard this before, if you disagree, um, if you've heard it a different way, if you think I'm doing a good job. Some of you might be sitting there going, boy, I don't know if I like those books on his shelf. Other people are going, wow, I really like the books on his shelf. Other people are going, does he have more or, or less hair than he did the last time? And why is his head so shiny? It's so big, right? They're not even listening to what I'm talking about because you're distracted by something else. Some people love the color blue, <laughs> right? And so, you know, our minds get really, some people are like, why does he have a dinosaur behind him? <laughs> okay, so we have lots of, of different things that are going on in our analytical mind. Then we have our unconscious mind. Now your unconscious mind is very powerful. Your unconscious mind has two prime objectives. One, it keeps your body running. Okay? It keeps your heart beating 100,000 times a day. It keeps your respiration, your blood flowing. It keeps everything working and running, which is pretty extraordinary because you don't have to think about it at all. right? You don't have to think about it at all. Your mind is running this part of you. The other part of it, its job is to make things happen. It's kind of like the emotional boss in your brain. Now, its prime goal is survival. So it's constantly trying to make you feel safe. So if you ever wondered why your mind tends to go to the negative, why your, ten or why your mind's always worrying about things, is because it's our, our cave person instincts. In the back of your brain, right, that back part of our brain, its goal is survival. It wants to make sure that we are safe. As we develop more and more um, intelligence and emotional intelligence and... Um, the ability to decide if we really are safe or not. Like some people can go uh, rock climbing and they love it. They've been able to take that part of their brain and I don't know, turn it off or re-channel it or something so that they are enjoying it and get excitement from it instead of like if I was going to go rock wall climbing, especially the way they, that some of these people do it, my brain would be screaming, you're going to die, you're going to die, get out of there, <laughs> right? Trying to keep me safe, which is probably a good idea. I'm glad my brain does that. But if my brain says, I'm going to drive to work, and then it starts saying, you're going to die, you're going to die, then I have to go, whoa, whoa, wait a second, brain, you know, wait a second, I am safe, I know I'm going to be okay, I'm going to be strategic, I can go slower, I can take a different route. If I get a weird gut feeling that something's off, I can pay attention to that. Sometimes your emotional mind will sense things that, and just pick it up somehow through our senses, and it's called our gut feelings, our intuitions, we get that tingly feeling. And we want to trust that, right? And so we want to make sure that we actually are um, using our brain to prepare us, not scare us. So information will come in to our mind and we talk about it in our conscious mind to ourselves. 
But in our unconscious mind, it's also the part of you where your beliefs are stored. We store our beliefs here. We store our attitudes, our life experiences, um, our frames of reference, right? Um, so what we value about things. Um, your belief, I am good or I am not good. I am worthy or I am not worthy. I am smart enough or I'm not smart enough. I can do this or I can't do this, right? All the experiences that you've had, all the, all the references that your brain references back to are stored in your unconscious mind. So often when information comes in, it gets swished through our filters, okay? So let's just say that in here we have a set of filters, just like you have like a filter, a water filter, okay, or a filter on your furnace. So we have these filters in here, and these filters are all your life experiences, and everybody has different, a different set of filters in here. And so what we've got to do is we've got to figure out what are your filters, what are your beliefs, right? Because your beliefs are more important than the experiences that you've had. Let me explain that. When you go through an experience, you form a belief about the experience. It's not what happens, it's the, it's the meaning that you give to it. It's how you perceive it, it's how you interpret it, it's what you tell yourself about the situation that matters more than the situation itself. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm five years old and I get punched in the arm and it hurts really bad and in that moment my unconscious mind says I'm unsafe, right? And then it looks around to try to figure out how I'm unsafe. So maybe another boy hit me, so men are, are unsafe, men are dangerous, right? You can't trust people. Okay, so I'm formulating all these ideas, the world is an unsafe place. Now, fast forward, I'm 30 years old, that'd be cool. <laughs> now I'm good where I'm at. But, um, but now I'm 30 years old, okay, my arm doesn't hurt anymore from when I got punched in, when I was five. My arm's fine, it doesn't hurt at all. However, I might still have that belief that I'm unsafe, you can't trust men, um, the world is an unsafe place, I could get hurt, um, and so, those beliefs cause me to feel like I just got punched in the arm just now. I'm keeping the pain alive because of the beliefs that I have about it. And that's often what happens with everything that we go through. All our traumas, all our hurts, all our wounds. You know, when I started working with veterans, I couldn't understand why some of them would come back with pretty severe post-traumatic stress and others seem to be just fine. And I couldn't figure out why that was. And um, there's a couple different theories on it. Sometimes it's just the person, their upbringing, their mindset. Sometimes it's the kind of trauma that they went through. Sometimes it's um, uh, people that come back with post-traumatic stress uh, had things happen to them that were unexpected, like they were a medic, right? Usually you think of combat veteran, but, but you, often it's um, like a medic where um, a hospital gets bombed they weren't expecting that. They're nowhere near the front line and they have all that trauma and it creates pretty strong post-traumatic stress. And so I was trying to figure out the differences and, and I think I know the differences in a lot of cases is the meaning that they gave to the situation, right? I'm a bad person because this happened. I should have done this and I didn't. I made this mistake and now my brothers or sisters aren't coming home and it's my fault, right? We start to have all these ideas that are put upon us and or that we make up on our own. Right? And uh, it's pretty horrible. Like when, when the Vietnam vets came home, they don't get the hugs at the airport. They weren't getting all that stuff back in the day when they came home. They had people yelling and protesting and hating and spitting and, and you know, I mean, being sent over when you're 18 and having no control over it, especially if you were drafted, and then coming home and people ostracizing you and calling you horrible things after you've been terrorized. Imagine being kidnapped and tortured and then coming home and then everybody hating you and telling you that it was your fault. We would never do that. That's called blaming the victim, right? That's a terribly abusive. But that's what happened to a lot of people. So sometimes we make up the interpretation and it traumatizes us, and other times other people make it up for us and put it upon us, and unfortunately we absorb it in, especially if we hear it enough times. But again, whether you got it externally or internally, you can start to transform it. You can start to change it, right? You can start to um, take back control because at the end of the day, whose mind is this, right? Your, well, this mind is mine, <laughs> right? But your mind is yours. Your mind is yours. Your mind is yours, okay? So at the end of the day, you're the boss in your head. You can say whatever you want in there. Now, you can argue all day that you can't say, I love myself, but you can. You can say those words, I love myself, right? You can say that. But if you're choosing not to, then what are you really fighting for? 
you're probably fighting for a negative, self-limiting belief, right? Why? The question is why? And if you think because you deserve it, then why? Right? Even if you did things that are bad, you don't punish yourself over and over forever. What you do is you learn from it, you forgive yourself, you try to make the situation better, and then you use those experiences to empower the lives of you and those around you. That's what you do with your pain. That's what we do with our pain. We use it to channel something good, right? Whenever we have a national tragedy, then what do we do? We always talk about how we rally together and we come together and we do something um, to find the good you know, in humanity and share that and shine a light on it. That's what we do. And so, um, so anyway, all right. So now, now that we're trying to figure out what these beliefs are, what do we do with it, okay? Because information will come in through your five senses. We get like one point or 2.4 million bits of data coming in through our five senses. What we see, what we hear, how we feel, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch. It comes in here, it gets switched through our filter. And then based on how we're holding our body, okay? Based on how we hold our body and based on um, the beliefs that we have, okay? Oh, that's a horrible beat. <laughs> Hang on, I'm trying to write in this really weird angle. Based on our body and our beliefs, we create an emotion. Okay? An emotion. I should have just said feeling. <laughs> okay? We create an emotion, and that emotion then comes back out through behavior. Okay? So our emotion, now this is behavior. Okay? I'm just going to abbreviate. Oh, behave. <laughs> All right, so data comes in, we switch it through our filters, depending on if we're feeling confident or we're feeling depressed, um, and based on our beliefs that are coming from our filters, it creates an emotional state, some kind of feeling, and then we act, we react based on how much awareness we have, right? So this happens lightning fast. Within a millisecond, our brain is so fast it can compute what's going on. And then what happens as a result is you know, the question is, are you going through life acting, intentionally deciding how you want to respond in a situation, or are you emotionally reacting um, based on programming from the past? So, all right. So that's in a nutshell what happens in your mind at kind of an unconscious level. Unless you're aware of it, then it becomes more conscious. So, now, how are we going to bring this back to weight loss, okay? So, here's how we're going to do it. we got a couple of things that we're going to do for weight loss. Okay, and then I'm going to give you um, something that's going to be really fun, uh, a free giveaway. Okay, we're going to do a little contest here and that'll be exciting. All right, so, um, okay, so here's what we're going to do. With weight loss, what we want to do is we want to figure out how have, have your filters, how have they been trained, right? Because you get training from your program, or, or I mean from your, um, from your family, right? You get from your society, from your culture, from your religion, from what's going on in your environment, in your country. Like in America, we are uh, live in a capitalistic society, so that means people do whatever they can to make as much money as possible. And a lot of uh, companies out there, um, they hurt us um, to make a buck, right? And so now we're in a time where we're starting to change that as well, but a lot of companies were very profit-driven. They didn't care about their employees. They didn't care about... Um, their consumers, uh, their customers, all they wanted was money. So that some people who had horrible ethics made a whole bunch of money in uh, drug companies, food companies, uh, medical companies. I mean, all kind of goes on and on and on, right? And so um, now we're finally standing up and demanding something different and changing that. But the people that have the most money, that are the most power, they're still doing it, <laughs> right? They're still doing it because where there's pain, there's profit. And so they just keep creating more pain for us so that we will go eat to distract ourselves, which then causes more pain. So we go eat to distract ourselves, which causes more pain. So we go eat to distract ourselves. That works out really good if you're the one selling the food. <laughs> Makes sense? Or the drugs, because you're now sick, because you now have type 2 diabetes, right? Because you have high cholesterol, because you are stressed out, because you can't sleep at night, because you are depressed, because you have all kinds of um, digestive issues now. Right? That works out real great for the pharmaceutical companies who give you pills that then give you more side effects that then make you more sick so that you have to get more medicine. Do you see how the cycles continue, continue, continue? And if you don't know that, then you get manipulated. Then you get controlled 
which that's where almost everybody is because most people don't know this stuff, right? And so what are your filters when it comes to, and another word for this are what are your beliefs, okay, when it comes to living healthy? Okay, so I hear beliefs all the time. Have you ever heard the belief that in order to lose weight, you must starve yourself? In order to lose weight, you have to deprive yourself of all your favorite things. In order to lose weight, you have to eat rabbit food. In order to lose weight, you have to, um, you can't go hang out and party with your friends anymore. Okay? To lose weight, you have to exercise for an hour every single day, um, major cardio. Okay? These, by the way, are all lies. To lose weight, it's all about counting, counting calories. No, that's a lie too. Okay? To lose weight, um, what's another one? Um, eating healthy is really hard. No, it isn't. Eating healthy is really expensive. No, it isn't. Okay? You can eat chicken breast and broccoli. Right? You might get sick of it, but you can do it, and it's super easy. It's super simple. Right? So, but we tell ourselves drinking water is really hard. That didn't seem hard at all. <laughs> okay? But if you tell yourself it is, then it becomes your reality. So what are you telling yourself? Okay? Now a lot of times we're telling ourselves and we don't even know we're telling ourselves this and that's the problem. So, so one of the things you want to do is you want to make sure that you are paying attention to the beliefs you have. Now here's a different set of beliefs, okay? Because I said that weight loss, real weight loss, is really about self-care, right? It's about making yourself a priority, loving yourself, taking care of yourself, setting those boundaries, and then finding ways to make it fun because that's what we really want. What we want is we want to feel good. We want to feel good physically. We want to have more energy. We want to feel like um, we're more self-confident when we're around other people. We want to feel like we look good in our clothes. That's what we really want. So that's what we go after. Sometimes we want more adventure, right? Or we want more physical intimacy. Or we want more... Um, sometimes we want more compliments. And you don't have to go up to others for those compliments. You give them to yourself first. And the more you compliment yourself, the more you're going to compliment others. The more you're complimenting yourself and you're complimenting others, the more you're going to get it back. You have so much power and influence. It's just the way that we try to create that influence is by trying to control out there instead of focusing on what's on he in here. There's another ancient phrase, really old, it says, when you learn to go within, you never go without. When you learn to go within, you never go without. When you learn to go within, you never go without. And so when people say go within, what does that mean? That means focus on this. Focus on your filters and your beliefs, right? Focus on that because that's where it's at. So, all right, so what we want to start to do is associate pleasure and pain in the right way. So, oh wait, before we go to pleasure and pain, let's talk about this for a second, okay? So, the other beliefs in, instead of, as well as, you know, um, how hard it is to lose weight, we also want to start telling ourselves, do I deserve it, right? Do I think I deserve this? Do I think that um, I'm good enough to have this? Because if you have a belief that says, I'm not good enough, I've tried everything, which is a lie, you haven't tried everything, you've probably tried three or four things that are the same approach, it just disguised differently. So you tried three or four different diets, but diets are the same approach, right? Different ingredients, but same approach. And uh, so that's not you trying the same thing. Oh, I've tried every diet out there. Yeah, but dieting is the same approach, right? I don't let my clients die. We don't do anything where the first three letters spell die. That's a D. <laughs> okay? We don't do anything that spells die, all right? So we don't do diets. Okay? We don't do diets. We uh, instead focus on um, empowering beliefs, right? And getting us to feel worthy. Now, I've had some clients that said, it's not safe for me to lose weight because I'll get it. Um, I might be more attracted to other people. And then I've had people say both ways. One, I might attract getting hurt, right? Um, or get harassment at work. Or the other way around is I'm afraid that if I start getting attention from men, I might not be faithful to my spouse. And so I've heard it all kinds of ways from all kinds of different people. So what I've learned is that we just got to make sure that we're paying attention to our beliefs. And that's what we start to upgrade faster than anything else. 
And it's real hard to do that on your own unless you start writing down, write down, and you can do this right now, just write down, what are my beliefs about weight loss? What are my beliefs about living healthy? Right? So now you've got two instructions. First, what is achieving this goal going to do for you ultimately? Ultimately, what is losing that weight going to do for you? That's what you go figure out then, right? Not how to lose weight, but how to get that other stuff. And then the second question is, what are my beliefs about weight loss? What are my beliefs about losing weight? And when you start writing those down, then you can say, is that motivating? Is that inspiring me? And if it isn't, what's the opposite of that? Okay? I can't do it becomes I can do it. I'm not good enough becomes I am good enough, right? I don't know how becomes I'm starting to learn how finally because I'm hanging out with Tim <laughs> and, and, uh, and, you're, and, you know, and you're learning about our body and mind transformation programs and classes. So, because I'll show you exactly how to do this because that's what I've spent all these years doing. Okay. All right. So now we're going to move on. What time is it? I have no idea. All right. So we got about 10, 15 minutes left. And if you have any questions, then you let me know. Okay. So, um, all right. Okay, cool. I'm just reading some of the messages. All right, awesome. So, okay, so here's the other thing. Um, now, once we understand what the beliefs are, now we've got to go after, um, and we upgrade the beliefs, the second thing that we do is we start retraining your brain for success. So, um, in that, people say that we are driven, um, all right, hang on, I'm just going to write this out. Okay, so we got pleasure and pain. Now, here's the deal. If your unconscious mind is always trying to create more pleasure and avoid more pain in life, then what we have to do when we talk about eating healthy or using fitness or sleeping better at night or reducing our stress, what we've got to do is we've got to pay attention to what we're associating pleasure and pain to. So, if you say that, um, you know, oh, I got to eat rabbit food, then you're associating pain to eating healthy and pleasure to eating junk. So let me tell you a story. So this is one of my favorite stories about um, one of my clients, Virginia. And I love Virginia. And she, uh, um, she was from southern Indiana. I'm here in Indianapolis and broadcasting live from, you know, getting a foot of snow. It's awesome. <laughs> anyway, so Virginia um, was going through my body and mind transformation program and uh, um, she had lost, oh, I don't know, she had probably lost about 20 pounds or so, but she had hit a plateau, and, uh, and nothing else was coming off, and she was a little frustrated about it, so we had a live class at the time, and I had a bunch of people in the room, and I overhear her talking to some of the other participants, and she's talking about her fried chicken, and her biscuits and gravy, and I was a little surprised that she's still talking about that, but she talked about it like it was the best thing ever, and she was such a great cook which is awesome. I've had a lot of chefs, a lot of bakers, a lot of um, you know people that are great with cooking, and um, but they were always eating and tasting and eating, and uh, they put on a considerable amount of weight, and what we did was we just got them still tasting, but they were just doing it and feeding others, and they got their love not from eating the food, but from um, you know taking care of other people, right? And so, and plus they'd start learning how to cook, so it wasn't just 50 pounds of butter anymore. So, um, but anyway, so Virginia's talking about her fried chicken and her biscuits and gravy. So I walk over there and I'm like, hey, Virginia, I said, tell me about the healthy food. And she's the one that said, what, rabbit food, like celery and carrots. And I said, see, here's what's happening. You're associating massive pleasure to the foods that are keeping you stuck. And that's what you've been complaining this whole time about what's keeping you stuck in your plateau. But you're associating massive pleasure to it and massive pain to the foods that would get you what you want, which is more pleasure over a long period of time. Because think about it, when you eat something that you think is, is yummy, but it's bad for you, when you eat that, it's only as good as long as it's in your mouth. You're not tasting it in your stomach. And then once it's in your stomach, you're not tasting any pleasure from that either. So if you get a big piece of deep dish pizza, it's in your mouth, it tastes good. When you swallow it though, that mouth pleasure is over. And so that's why we're like, well, I need more mouth pleasure. So we have more and then we have more and we have more mouth pleasure. And then finally we're full. And so then the pleasure's over in that five or 10 minutes that you were eating. Now it's all in your gut. Now all the bread, all the sugar, all the flour, all the cheese, all the dairy is now in your gut. Now you feel like crap. 
Now you're tired, now you're exhausted, now you have fatigue, now you don't feel good. Some people get a headache or a stomach problem or yeast problems and now they're not sleeping good that night. So what's happened is they had 10 minutes of mouth pleasure, oops, sorry, 10 minutes of mouth pleasure and now they're gonna get another 12 hours of pain. That's like taking a, a aspirin to get rid of a migraine and it gives you one, right? That sucks. And so we won't be taking those anymore, but that's what we do with food because it's like our brain forgets and says, yeah, but it, it tasted good. It tasted good. So anyway, I said, Ginny, you are, you are just got this backwards. We need to flip it. What I want you to do is associate massive pleasure to the healthy eating and massive pain to all the junk food that's holding you back. And she looked at me like I had two heads. When I told her to make her chicken painful, she looked at me like I was crazy. Right? She's like, she like, hmm? Right? But she, we had trust. We had rapport. She knew where my heart was. We had already gotten results with her. And so she's like, okay. So she left. I saw her about three weeks later. Okay? She comes strolling in and, I, and she's all smiling. I'm like, Ginny, why are you smiling? She says, I'm down seven more pounds. I'm like, seven pounds in three weeks? Wow, that's amazing. What have you been doing? She says, Tim, let me tell you about my Hawaiian buffet. I got my wooden bowl and I get my greens from the garden and I put in my treats. And I'm like, what's your treat? She says, oh, my bell peppers, my red peppers, my yellow peppers, and I got my cucumbers and my cherry tomatoes. And I'm like, wow. And she says, oh, yeah. And she says, I'll get my piece of fish or my piece of chicken. And then I got my glass of water and I just put a slice of lemon in it. Oh, child, it's like being on vacation. I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. I said, but what about the fried chicken? And she goes, chicken? She says, oh, it makes me greasy. I haven't had that for weeks. And I was like, yes. Okay, now what did she do? She started associating pleasure with eating healthy and pain to the other stuff. Now, did that happen all at once? Of course not. It took time. But three weeks is pretty fast, right? To start to create a new habit, a new way of being. And that led to her getting the rest of her results because she was changing the way she was talking to herself. She was associating pleasure and pain in the right way. Now, another way that we can do it with, is with exercise or fitness. Now, most of the time, people do the fitness the wrong way anyway, but I don't have time to talk about that right now. That'll be for another video. But usually, people associate which with exercise and fitness, pleasure or pain? <laughs> I heard most of you say pain, and then a couple of you that are in good shape Pleasure, <laughs> okay? In the, when you're doing it, in the beginning, it can feel a little uncomfortable, but then you start to feel energy all day. Then you start to feel more um, flexible. Then you start to feel stronger. That muscle, when you're exercising your muscles, lifting weights and strength training is way better than cardio, and when, for weight loss specifically. And when you start um, doing that, like 10 minutes of, of lifting, your body's still burning fat, like, a couple days later, some people say. I mean, that's amazing. You'd be sitting on your couch and your muscles are burning fat still. That's amazing, right? That's a lot of pleasure from a little bit of a little bit of discomfort, okay? So, and the goal is you keep doing that. You keep stacking that in your favor until pretty soon the fitness now starts to feel pleasurable. You actually start to enjoy it. It takes about three or four weeks to start to really enjoy it, but then it starts to kick in and wow, you're really liking this and you're getting all the results. Now it's just pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And that's what we want. And then you miss a day. You ever been in a regular fitness routine and you miss a day? You know what happens? Now you feel like crap. You're like, oh, I don't have as much energy as I normally do. Oh, I got to get back into it first thing tomorrow, right? Because now we've got it correct in our mind if you want to take weight off and keep it off. So those are some things that I wanted to talk about today, okay? I wanted to talk about how your mind works and how to solve the real problems that have to do with losing weight. It's really not about calories. People will step up and make those things happen naturally when they're motivated. And, and, uh, and so that's what we want to do. We want to set ourselves up inside so that we naturally feel motivated because you cannot get yourself to stay motivated long term to do things that you hate. It's just not going to work. You can tough it out. You can push it out. We can use hypnosis even for a little while, but you're going to stop if you hate it. So we've got to find a way to get you to like it or, or like a new approach and like a different way of doing it. And that's where the real magic is. That's where the real secret is. That's where your real breakthroughs are. And so being able to do that is pretty extraordinary. So, uh, all right. Any questions on here? Just a lot of people watching, being mesmerized. <laughs> Uh, all right, refreshing water, power breaths, <sighs> it's a good day. Okay, 
So, um, let me tell you about a class that we have coming up, okay? Because instead of just you having to learn all of this at once, which is a lot, what I would like to do is take you on a nine-week journey. We go once a week over a course of nine weeks for about an hour, hour and a half, once a week in the evening, and um, unless you're in Australia, which some of my clients are, then it would be in the morning. <laughs> then, um, and what you're going to do is, <laughs> that's good, that's good. Kathleen's like, I enjoy cardio exercise. Yay, that's awesome. So I bet it wasn't always that way though, huh? <laughs> so, um, so we have our class coming up, right? And uh, it starts um, January 30th. It'll go through March 27th. It's a nine-week class, and it is extraordinary because I'm going to take you through these mind training experiences. Each week, I'm going to teach you something really cool about eating or fitness or crushing cravings or building self-esteem and self-confidence, getting better sleep at night, putting boundaries in place, and then any other problems or challenges the group have, we're just going to go ahead and melt them away, right? Showing you how to train your brain for success. It's, it's really amazing. Then I'm going to take you through one of my brain training experiences because those are really powerful. So let me get in there and kind of train your brain for you. I've been doing it for a long time and I'm really good at it. And so all I need is for you to show up and I'll take care of the rest. So we do all of that. Then we're going to record these sessions. So you have review and reinforcement forever. We also, um, I'm bringing in Paula, who is my fitness and nutrition guru. At the age of 50, she decided, or at the age of 49, after she had beaten breast cancer, she decided that she wanted to um, become a natural bodybuilding championship. Now, she was about 50 pounds overweight and unmotivated and drinking a little too much and stressed out and... And we started going through our stuff, and um, and then at the age of 50, her first time out, she placed third. And then she kept going, and now she has won first place um, a couple of different times. It's pretty extraordinary. And so um, that's who you want in your corner. Most of my clients are over the age of 50. I have some younger, but I, on purpose, um, went after helping people um, over the age of 50 because it seems like we get left out, right? So... Um, a lot of the programs that you see out there are for 20 and 30 somethings and all the exercise boot camps and all the stuff they have those are for the youngins and so we need people who are still young at heart you know but need some more appropriate better tools and strategies but even those 20s and 30 somethings usually can't get the weight off or they lose it and just gain it all back um, because they don't have the mindset shift so and when people say oh it's all about mind shift, mind, mindset that's the catchphrase and you're right but people don't know, act, actually know how to train a mindset. All they know is to be inspiring and say positive things, but they don't know how to really find and shift the beliefs inside and how to create the new neural associations that are going to make the magic happen in your brain. That's the stuff that I focus on almost exclusively, and then the rest of it falls into place, and then um, my gurus like, fit, uh, like Paula, she's able to come in and teach you all the nutrition stuff and... Um, and answer your questions about supplements. She says there are some pl supplements that really are great. Most of them are end up in the toilet, though. They're not very good for you. And so um, they don't really do anything. So uh, I'm bringing her in for that. And I'm paying her. You don't have to, right? So I'm paying her to come in on one of those classes and uh, share her expertise and answer your questions. So we also, people, the only thing that uh, holds them back is money. And uh, so what I've done is I've made this class. This is my... Um, affordability class for everybody to be able to get in so it's a third it's 997 for the class for the whole nine weeks which is a third or more of what you would cost to go through something like this normally so uh, I think that's amazing what you get for a two and a half month program is pretty uh, awesome right and especially for all the reinforcement and you get access to all the all that reinforcement so you have it that's awesome and uh, and then the only other objection people have is what if it doesn't work for me because that's fear Right, just because they have experiences from the past, but this is something totally new. And remember, you miss 100% of the shots you never take, so you got to take this shot. And um, and so um, the other thing that uh, I have is, of course, my stay with you guarantee, right? My safety net guarantee. So all my programs and products are guaranteed. So if you're unhappy about it, then um, uh, let me know, and I'll give you your money back. So um, you know. You can't really, there's no way to lose. <laughs> the only way you can lose is to not do this, right? And if you want to lose the weight, you have to do this. If you want to build your confidence back up, you have to do this. If you only want to lose a couple pounds, but you want to have more vitality and energy and self-confidence, you should do this because this isn't really a weight loss program. Weight loss is what happens naturally as a positive side effect. But this isn't a weight loss program because people who focus on losing weight tend to gain five pounds, right? Like a diet. 
This is a mind training program. That's why I call it a body and mind transformation because you got to transform your mindset to transform your waistline. Okay, if you want to create sustainable long-term results, because if you lose weight and then gain it back in a year, uh, that's not a victory, right? That stinks. I hate to. I hate when that happens. So you know, I'll be definitely teaching how to prevent relapse in these classes. So, all right. Well, it looks like I am done with. Um, Instagram because it just shut off so it must be uh, only an hour <laughs> so that means my time is probably up so with that said then um, if you have any questions leave comments below if you want to go to um, www.loseweighteasier.com and then forward slash calendar uh, you can register there okay so it's www.loseweighteasier.com forward slash calendar and, uh, and that's where you will be able to learn more about the class and register. If you can't make it for January, I've got my whole calendar on there. So you can register for, um, for uh, the one that's in the spring and then the one that's in uh, the fall. Okay, so I'm planning on doing them three times a year. And then the other class that I'm going to do three times a year is the Path to Emotional Freedom. That's not really about weight loss at all. That's focused totally on building self-confidence. If you're someone that says, I don't have any self-confidence, I can't get motivated, I can't get out of bed in the morning, that's the program for you because I'm going to show you not only how to transform your past but how to transform your present so that you can have a mesmerizing future. Okay. So, all right, thanks so much for being with me today. I really appreciate you. You guys are amazing and the reason why I do this. So, uh, I hope you've learned a lot and if you have, oh, a contest. Let me tell you about my contest real quick. So, if you are sharing this with people, with like share it with three people, and um, and then let me know, okay? Share it with three people and let me know and then subscribe to my podcast. I got a couple things for you. My podcast, you can subscribe at timsure.com forward slash podcast. I'll put all the links below. If you subscribe for my podcast at um, timsure.com forward slash podcast and then you share this video that we're doing right now with um, at least three people and tell them how much value you got from it, then um, come back to underneath this video in the comment section and simply put done. Okay, just put the word done and, uh, and let me know. And then I will take your name and I'm going to put it in a raffle and I'm going to select one person to do a free uh, body and mind transformation private session. Okay, so I'll just collect all the names, throw it in a hat, have my wife pick out a name and then I'll let you know. And, um, and that's going to be pretty awesome. Okay, so I hope you do this. Because uh, we want to get some momentum. We want to get this out into the world and I can't do it without your help So please help me out. Okay. All right. Thanks. So uh, I appreciate you being here today That's it for now make today a sure success and I'll talk to you soon. Bye everybody. Bye